Good evening, hello and welcome to News Epicenter. I'm Anusha Soni. The Indian High Commission building in the tricolour was vandalised on the 19th of March in London. Another round of so-called protest has already been organised and it's underway by separatist elements in London and UK. New Delhi here has taken a stand and in a show of rare optics, barricades have been removed from outside the British High Commission office in the national capital. In the state of Punjab, the manhunt launched by the state police to nab Amritpal Singh, that's on. Multiple state police agencies are working round the clock to nab this man who's responsible for waging a war against national security and threatening the rule of law in the state. Our focus is on the protests which are happening in London, what happens there and all eyes on whether this time London police is able to do its job, which is to keep the Indian High Commission secure. Our top focus. Commissioner's residence in the national capital and you can see how the security has in fact been removed from here. Standing outside uh, the British High Commission and you can see that uh, uh, normal internal security is there but uh, no sort of barricading or police presence for that matter. London Indian Embassy के ऊपर से जो तिरंगा हटाया गया इन लोगों ने पूरी दुनिया में सिख कौम को बदनाम करने का काम किया है Local police of London are trying their best to ensure that what happened last Sunday does not get to the grid. There's enough barricading on both sides of the street here. Barricades being put up and a heavy security presence being placed to ensure there is no breakdown of law and order. Well, getting us a sense from the ground is Ritangshu Bhattacharya. He is live with us from the Indian High Commission in London. Let me quickly take in a word from him. Ritangshu, uh, what's the situation like there? An uneasy calm that prevails. The situation under control so far, so good? Well, yes, indeed. Uh, the situation is under control. What we have done is we've come back on this side, right in front of the Indian High Commission here. Let me just turn the camera around to show what's happening. The protest is on the other side of the street. Uh, you can, it's been a bit obscure by traffic right now. Meanwhile, I'll just show you where I am. Hmm. This is, of course, in front of the High Commission again. What the local police have done is, uh, after initially barricading this entire area off, they've allowed pedestrian traffic to go by and also some of the media contingent here as well. So the important thing which our viewers in India will be happy to see is that the flag of the tricolor is safe and secure. It's fastened with barbed wire, as you see. The other bigger tricolor, which uh, looks as a kind of... So, we're just closing the gates now. So okay. Everyone needs to leave. This. All right. All right. So they've just asked us to once again uh, um, uh, to clear this area out. So I'll just walk back a bit. But you can see this is the crowd uh, which has assembled here. Hmm. Uh, it's a crowd of about 200 to 300 people through a very rough estimate, I can say, hmm. at this moment. Sorry, officer. And, uh, and uh, yeah. So they're right. clearing this area out again. Right. There are about 300 to 400 people who have accumulated. So far, it's been a peaceful protest. Hmm. Logans hmm. are being chanted for Khalistan, for Amritpal Singh. The, there are uh, placards there as well. Yeah. There are some anti-India and anti-Modi slogans which have been shouted here as well. Hmm. But largely peaceful. The Met Police is asking us to clear the barricades as well. And okay. we cooperate with them because we don't want any obstructions law and order. But yes, so this is the Ritansho, situation if, this if one were to uh, contrast the... this with the kind of arrangements that were made last time. Also, uh, yeah. what, what's the key difference? And the second aspect that you can perhaps tell us is, who are these groups per se? Is, is, there a, is there a name of these organizations who are organizing these protests? As Ritangshu gets us all those details, those are the local officers there at the, the London police, which is trying to clear that entire area. Ritangshu, coming back to you, the two points. One is, if we were to contrast today with what happened on the 19th of March, what was different? And secondly, who are these organizations which are protesting? Is there one single group which has organized this so-called protest? Well, Anusha, uh, I've, there, what we see so far are flags with Khalistan and flags with Punjab referendum. So that gives us an idea of the, uh, about the groups. So they've been very careful not to highlight one specific political or one specific religious group which they're coming yeah. from uh, in order to keep the messaging or the broader messaging on our Khalistan. 
uh in terms of the secure uh, security before I, ju- i just reach upon uh, touch upon security and sure two things which i like to mention here the crowd is increasing hmm. there are a lot of people coming in from other uh, from uh, different streets and they're all accumulating in this area which you see here hmm. uh mostly it's been peaceful so far but there are people with face coverings and hoods as well and so it's a state of uneasy calm there are miners who are also a part of this protest and they are being made to hold up placards and slogans as well hmm, hmm. in terms of security deployment compared to last sunday the situation could not be any more different here yes. this is generally an area which has very little if not zero local police presence here as is the case with most normal streets of london hmm. but this time there's a very very heavy police barricading which is here on both sides there are Uh, they are periodically sanitizing this area in front of the indian high commission to ensure that there's no scope of the high commission being overwhelmed by people right, as it was right, right. uh it's still a bit too early to say whether this protest has uh is has flopped or such because it's swelling in numbers but so far it looks to be a peaceful protest on issue i hope it remains peaceful and this time there's no damage to the indian high commission uh, my colleague ritankshu getting us all the details we'll continue going to ritankshu and getting more details the protests are underway the numbers are rising the number of protesters are increasing but it remains peaceful so far that's the good part we're well, taking this entire issue to our guest as well mr arun anand who's a consulting editor of first post is with us on the broadcast adit kothari who's the founder of indic society from london is with us on the show mr sushant sareen who's a senior fellow from orf and mr anil trigunyath who's a former diplomat is also with us on the broadcast mr anil trigunyath coming to you first and taking in a view uh, there is a rare show of optics that the Nash, uh, that new delhi has done here in the national capital the british high commission the office and the residence of the commissioner barricades were removed this was to drive home the point that we're not liking what's happening in london the authorities can do better and there is far more action that was anticipated by the london police and authorities do you think that messaging has gone well i hope so as you know the diplomacy is the game of reciprocity yeah and uh, with regard to the britishers it has been done several times in the recent past uh, they were not uh, acknowledging or respecting the vaccine that came from their country and was produced in india yeah. when the indians were vaccinated so india had to uh, take that action and dr jay shankar was very clear and once we did same thing applied for the visas hmm. now this is not the first time india has taken if you remember one of our diplomats uh, was harassed in new york yes. at one time and yes. this is exactly what we had done few years ago hmm. so it is absolutely essential but on the larger question is that the diplomatic missions work under the vienna conventions under which it is incumbent upon the host state to provide security and to protect the diplomats and the diplomatic missions mm. and they're working in their countries and these are the standard protocol and practices mm. now we have seen that the british government has repeatedly failed or the police or law and order authorities have repeatedly failed uh, to to protect the indian mission it is not the first time it has happened and therefore it but, is absolutely but anil ji do you do you really failed. think that this failure is something which just happened or this was deliberate because uh, there are certain ground reports that had come in and my colleague uh, who's been reporting from the ground earlier had also pointed out that how during london riots the london police was very proactive they ensured that everybody who created a ruckus who was a threat to law and order uh, you know was taken into custody the due process of law was followed when uh, events like 19th of march and what happened at the indian high commission is allowed and uh, the manner in which the arrests have happened it could be said that the arrests are not happening at the pace that they should be about one or two people have been arrested do you think this is deliberate well it clearly is max of uh, the deliberate act or the complicity on the part of the authorities hmm. and i always say that this appears to be a very a, a grand design which is happening across various western countries mm. it is not here it happened in san francisco the other day our consulate was again attacked and so they know where who are khalistani elements yeah. they allowed them the referendums despite indian government's protests and so it very clearly is some kind of a, a design against uh, the indian state uh, mr sushant sareen i'm coming to you taking in a point from you as far as this design against the indian state is concerned um elements like these pro separatist elements uh, are not just active in uk but in countries like canada usa even australia india has repeatedly stated this position that we are unhappy with these kind of groups being allowed to run their activities on foreign soil should india take a stronger position yeah i i think you need to distinguish between uh, the different countries okay. uh, i think uh, there is a particular problem in the uk and in canada hmm. in san francisco you know uh, very often people plead that the police has become so dysfunctional 
that they can't protect uh, can't they're not even able to do their normal policing hmm. how do you expect them to protect anything not that that's an excuse hmm. but one can even understand uh, what is happening in frisco yeah. uh, australia of course is a new case but i think the australians have uh, moved uh, with a certain degree of alacrity and are now cracking down on these fellows hmm. but i think uh, britain and canada are particularly problematic hmm. uh, britain because the brits have always played these games i for a second uh, do not believe that there was no complicity of the british establishment with what happened not just on on the 19th yeah. but it's happened on a number of occasions in the past now i can understand the first time it happens it's an accident it happens and you don't know you were caught unawares hmm. but if it happens uh, you know one after another after another then clearly there's something seriously wrong now hmm. uh, you know the brits seem to claim at least to have a fabulous intelligence system internally hmm. uh, have they not got any fix on these uh, thugs and terrorists both the khalistani variety and the pakistani variety do they have absolutely no clue what these guys are up to now i know i and i know because it's in the public domain that the pakistan high commission in the united kingdom in london yeah. actually pays people actually pays people to carry out these demonstrations yeah. they either pay people or they intimidate members of their diaspora to come out on the streets they bust them over uh, in front of the indian high commission to then assault and attack the indian high commission mm. do, do the brits not know this mm. and what do they do about it nothing mm. absolutely nothing so for them to now pretend that suddenly they've woken up and then make this tamasha down now we are putting in a lot of security yeah. lot of cops all of that that's utter nonsense i i don't i don't buy anything which, you know which the brits say because they have always well, sir, that, right from 1947 that takes me 48. logically to another limb of the uh, argument mr arunanand um i i think that's a fair point that sushant sareen has made that with the kind of you know intelligence acumen the kind of inputs that the brits have uh, the manner in which they claim that they have a rule of law in their country they must be aware about what's happening and how are these groups really running the the hand of pakistan is not unknown it's not something new but it's creating serious troubles here in india and right now with the state of punjab trying to clamp down on element uh, like amritpal singh and varis punjab day this becomes a direct internal security situation why is uk government taking the position that it is and it's not new mr anand if you can hear me sir all right i'll try and connect with mr arun anand i i guess there's a network issue there mr adit kothari is the founder of indic society from london is also with us on the show mr kothari uh, would you would you would you share see, I, would you share the I, same uh, you know perception that mr sushant sareen has or the analysis that he has uh, rather put forward that somewhere there's a complicity of the administration it's, it's very rarely that i get to disagree with uh, sushant ji unfortunately today is not one of those days i i completely concur that uh, you know what the uk agencies the polity the security apparatus has been doing vis-a-vis -vis all of these uh, malfunctioning of their security uh, uh, with regards to pro providing security to the indian high commission and mm -hmm. this is not the mm -hmm. first time it's happened concurring number of times it's okay. merely paying lip service you mm -hmm. know whether it be in 1973 84 during ravindra mathre's murder you know even 2019 when you know the indian high commission came under immense attack from both you know the cabal of uh, the islamists in conjunction with the with the khalistanis all we got was just lip service yeah. and we we never got anything beyond that hmm. the problem however i see is more from the indian side and this this is something that the indian diaspora has been demanding for a very very long time hmm. that i think the indian the indian diplomacy needs to come out and make the cost much higher hmm. i think you know the fta has been overlooming for a very long time why don't you attach a security concern to that fta hmm. uh, you know all of these people who have been easily identified with regards to you know who were the people who were essentially in front of the indian eye commission hmm. uh, you know who were the people who were essentially creating the ruckus you know they have been identified most of them are on asylum visa some of them are on student visa cancel everything you know demand that the uk no i i i do take i do take that point sense. that perhaps the cost should be increased anil ji i'm coming back to you is uh, does india have that bargaining power can we increase the cost 
if in any country, say in UK, which is one of the you know uh, superpowers of the world, uh, if it allows certain kind of anti-India activities to fester on its soil to the extent of what we saw on the 19th of March and even at some other uh, earlier instances, Mr. Sarin also drew a special case for Canada and UK. Uh, does India have it that we can raise the diplomatic cost or any kind of trade cost related to UK? Can we have that bargaining chip with them? Well, if, I think that I fully agree uh, with both Sushant and uh, your uh, colleague from the UK mm. uh, that the costs have to be increased. And I think that the government is looking at it and we have seen that it has yielded. Mm. As I mentioned earlier, it happened during the vaccine cases and the visas, both okay. the cases when Dr. Jashankar just very plainly told his counterpart, uh, they yielded very quickly and everything started working all right. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, this is precisely the language the the these so-called uh, superpowers understand mm. when you come from the position of strength. Mm. And India is not a banana republic. It does know how to deal with these kind of situations. And I'm quite sure mm. um, this is going to happen gradually, systematically and very in direct manner. Mr. Anand, coming to you, I hope you can hear me this time. We were talking about the yeah. fact that how is it that India can raise the cost? And it's it's true that for decades, this kind of issues when it co comes to countries like Canada and UK, especially in, in America and Australia as well, but more so in countries like UK and Canada. How is it that we can ensure that the governments in these respective countries don't in some way become complicit with anti-India elements? In fact, there are some people who are openly anti-India, pro-separatists uh, and are part of the governments in, in the country of Canada. That's, that's very, very problematic for a country like India. See, uh, I think uh, it's it's a uh, uh, it's not actually beyond a point practically possible okay. because you know India being emerging as a as a, as a global power, mm. so that doesn't suit you know most of the the, the existing global order. Mm. So uh, we we can't expect you know that uh, the Western world is going to do anything basically which uh, you know kind of uh, strengthen India. Mm. Rather, you know there will always be elements in the establishment. Uh, who would rather nurture or kind of basically look the other way around as uh, we have seen happening in UK mm. uh, and in some other parts of the world. Mm. Uh, because uh, anything which hurts India at one level uh, that suits the Western world also. So I think that is one thing. But India has to constantly maintain a pressure and I think the Indian diaspora can play a very significant role in this. Mm. Because as we saw you know, when this Leicester uh, riots happened some time back in UK. Hmm. The Indian diaspora had played a very significant role in that, hmm. uh, in terms of you know uh, kind of uh, countering the misinformation campaign. So uh, I think that is what needs to be done, and there has to be a consistent you know uh, campaign to dispel this uh, you know uh, the false uh, narratives. Uh, the role that diaspora can play. It's an it's an interesting point that you read, Mr. Mr. Sareen, I'm coming back to you. Uh, while on one hand, look, all is fine between India and Canada, great relationship, India and UK, cultural ties, trade ties, many other cooperation that has happened between the two nations, diaspora from India to UK, of course, huge number. But that being said, th there's a very candid point that Mr. Arun Anand just made, that anything anti-India somehow happens to favor the Western powers. And that position has sustained. Uh, can the diaspora play an active role in, uh, you know, changing that position? I think both the diaspora can play a role and India itself can play a role. Yeah. For example, you talk about leverages over Britain. You know, uh, how many thousands of students go to Britain every year? Hmm. Virtually, British universities are being run by the monies we pay. Exactly. British citizens pay one third of the fees which our students go and pay out there. Hmm. Right? That's a big leverage that you have. Hmm. You can start de-recognizing British degrees. In any case, the people who go to Britain, what do they come back with? Hmm. They come back with that goddamn woke culture of theirs and, and spread all kinds of nonsense out here anyways. So I think we can do away with, you know, we, we have leverages, number one, on the trade issues like Adit spoke about. Uh, there are a number of other things we can do. See, in, in the case of Canada, again, yeah. uh, there is the student uh, issue. There is many other issues. But I, where I uh, partly agree with Mr. Anand and where I have a slight disagreement with him. Okay. Look, uh, I suspect that what is happening over the last couple of years is that this is being not used to damage India as much as used as a leverage against India. Okay. You know, uh, and, and for example, uh, last time, 
during the 1980s when the Khalistan movement was at its peak, the Brits and the Americans and all of the other Western countries turned a complete blind eye to it. Mm. They com completely turned a blind eye to all the bomb blasts, the massacres that were taking place in Punjab. Mm. Uh, but the reason was because India was seen as in the Russian camp. Russia was in Afghanistan. The entire Western world was fighting a war out there. Mm. This time around, I don't know, and I'm speculating out here. Okay. Is it that uh, maybe because India is trying to pursue a somewhat independent foreign policy vis-a-vis yeah. -vis yeah. Russia, Ukraine, uh, war uh, on a number of other issues, yes. that maybe this is being used as a kind of a lever against India. But even okay. if it is, the fact that you are not able to protect an Indian mission and you're not able to protect members of the Indian diaspora who happen to be your citizens, that you are leaving them open to assault by these thugs and these terrorists, I think raises serious questions about the kind of civilization you claim you are. The and kind and of more importantly, and all the civil uh, you know, the rule of law, a principle, it, it is said that it came from, you know, the, the English, the rule of law, the principle, the law must catch up. It hasn't really when it comes to these cases. Uh, the number of arrests that should have happened in a matter like this have not really happened. Adit, do you, do you agree that a diaspora can play a ro role, of course, with the Indian government and them taking yeah. a different position? But was, what is the role that perhaps student community, a very strong vocal community, the business community can play in a country like UK? You know, that's what we have been working very hard to sort of unite mm. and sort of galvanize the Indian diaspora to come out and be aware of these kind of narratives that have been playing, playing out against not only India, but against now the civilizational values of India. Mm. Uh, you know, the Leicester riots happened and, and, and the kind of disinformation that, that was out not only from the media, mm. but also from the academia was absolutely shocking. And that's where I think the student community really needs to come strong. Mm. And I think the government of, 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 of the days also needs to come out and, and, and call that out because the kind, of, uh, the kind of rabid agenda or the false narratives being peddled out through various UK universities is absolutely damning. I mean, from stop caste yes. discrimination to dismantling global Hindutva, to uh, you know how India is treating its own minorities. These are narratives which are playing out in UK universities day in day out. They're inviting people like Muzammil Ayub Thakur, who's a known terrorist in in India, and he gets a platform um, you know at King's College to, mm. to go out and engage with students. So the the Indian government also needs to tackle this at at a much more systemic level. That's, and, and you know and, and I I want I want to take this I want to take this a step ahead. So far we have spoken about the discourse posturing, uh, whether people have been arrested or not. They're not able to provide security to the Indian High Commission. Well, those are issues and things which are visible to the naked eye. Uh, Anilji, but it has to be. Uh, a thick nexus of anti-India elements which are operating out of foreign nations. And one suspects that there are certain groups which are operating out of UK and Canada, which are not just propelling this anti-India discourse, but there is a solid financial backing to it. And this nexus right, uh, runs right into the state of Punjab. And that is how elements like Amritpal Singh could have been planted. And I find it difficult to believe that the authorities wouldn't know about it. Well, as I told you earlier, I think that this is uh, the Indian authorities, if they are, they do not know, then um, I mean, uh, it is absolute, uh, a totally unacceptable situation because mm -hmm. the Khalistani elements have been from time and again, have been rising in those countries where we talked about the funding comes from there. There are various methodologies that they adopt and India government very well knows yeah. how they work. Our intelligence community must be aware of it. Mm. Why we have intelligence cooperation with different countries also at the same time. We know ISI has been working overdrive um, in uh, fomenting trouble in Punjab, uh, especially as uh, India reaches the election time. Mm. But this time it happens to be a nexus, in my view, um, both the deep state in those countries, hmm. as well as with ISI and these Pakistani and local elements who have been uh, uh, troubled. But fact remains is that we need to take uh, exemplary action. And as has been mentioned, it has to be a holistic hmm. approach, uh, both in India within and outside India also. We need to do that. Hmm. I mean, if uh, we have exactly certain costs, of these, this message has to go very clear irrespective of the fact that there's a G7, G20, what all, those are those are there. But at the same time, we need to be very careful that if your internal security is compromised, then it is extremely difficult for you to sustain anything further. Mr. Arun Anand, there's a question on uh, the manner in which an element like Amritpal Singh, relatively new to Punjab's political sector, was able to expand himself politically and culturally. 
uh, it is very clear that he was propped up in the state of Punjab by anti-India elements. But the question is also on the Punjab government and the authorities and the law and order machinery that how was he allowed to do what he was doing? And it's only when, you know, it, it crossed a certain line and there was a police station which was threatened and there were, uh, you know, there was a fear that law and order situation could go out of hand in the, in the border state of Punjab. Only did then the authorities act. Even right now, he's on the run. There's a question that we must ask internally as well. I think uh, you are absolutely right. We need to set our own house in order also. Hmm. Uh, we can tackle these Khalistani elements abroad if we are able to tackle, you know, the situation here. Uh, also, uh, because uh, until and unless we set our own house in order, I think it will be very difficult for India to have that kind of, a, you know, a kind of moral standing also where we can talk tough with the foreign government. But yeah. having said that, see, the problem is that uh, law and order is a state subject hmm. and the central agencies couldn't intervene directly. And we have a government in Punjab, uh, which has proved to be basically a disaster as far as law and order is concerned. Hmm. I think it's a colossal failure. I don't have any doubt in saying that it's a colossal failure on the part of the Amadmi Party government, which is sitting there. And uh, they should have acted well in time. Yeah. You allow, you know, uh, police stations to be attacked. And before that, also a number of incidents have happened. Hmm. You talk to your reporters uh, in Punjab. And of course, they must have been telling you, you know, it's a terrible situation. Yes. Which is, yes. uh, it's an overall terrible situation there. Hmm. So I think it's a colossal failure. But now being a, in a federal structure hmm. and then, you know, with having Aam Aadmi Party government there. So uh, beyond a point, you know, you can't do anything. So I think that's a challenge which we are facing. Mr. Sushant Sareen, uh, it's a colossal failure. Would you agree with that assessment of Mr. Arun Anand that these separatist elements from the UK soil or the Canadian soil are doing what they want to do? But it's our country, our internal security that we have to defend at the end of the day. Yeah, but you know, but I wouldn't pin it only on the Ahmadbi Party. I think sure. uh, they must certainly take their share of the blame hmm. because they've been in government for over a year now. Uh, and a lot of this stuff has been happening under their watch. Uh, plus, there are uh, serious allegations and insinuations being made uh, about their links with some of these elements. Yeah. But I think uh, as, as a nation and as a polity, we have taken our eye off the ball, at least insofar as Punjab is concerned. This thing has not started just yesterday or one year back or after this clown Amrit Pal Singh came back. Uh, this has been brewing for a fair bit of time. There has been this... Uh, you know, this subterranean kind of a propaganda which has been going on. Hmm. They've tried to revive the Khalistani movement within India. We know it for a fact, Anusha, that there has been this growing nexus between the terrorists, between the drug mafia uh, and, 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 and politics, of course, yeah. uh, and the gangsters. So we know all of this has been, you know, kind of, there's been an intersection of all of these, hmm. which is now being reflected in the toxic politics uh, and the toxic rhetoric which we hear in Punjab. So hmm. this has been brewing for some time. Uh, and, and we haven't really cracked down on it. Uh, so one part is, of course, the law and order machinery, uh, sure. tightening it up sure. and ensuring that these guys, uh, you know, stay within the four corners of the law. Hmm. But apart from that, there is another campaign that has to be run. Hmm. The, you know, the kind of disinformation and the kind of pernicious uh, propaganda that has been carried out hmm. uh, to drive a wedge between the communities that needs to be addressed Absolutely. and you see the <clears throat> government and all its agencies and all the people uh, well-meaning people uh, being totally remiss in addressing that particular aspect of the problem hmm. so hmm. i think we need to attack this at multiple levels this For not sure. just a For one sure. kind of a dimension to this issue there are multiple dimensions to it uh, and that is what uh, will will pull us through but at least I think the good part, Anusha, is that at least people have finally woken up. Ajnala was a blessing in disguise because otherwise we were sleepwalking into a disaster. Until Ajnala happened, Absolutely. this whole Amritpal thing was being played down. Yeah. After Ajnala, nobody can duck this entire issue. So it has received the kind of salience it should have got when this guy first emerged on the scene. And, but even and, now, and it's Mr. not Sareen, too late. I, I agree with you there that, it, that there's just not one layer or one angle from which this needs to be countered. Uh, whether it's the security angle, the financial angle, even the manner in which the discourse is being put out, the wedge between the communities which is being driven, all of that need to be tackled. Adit, I'm coming to you. When it comes to lumpen elements like Amrit Pal Singh, which are a direct threat to India's internal security, how is he perceived in UK? There are various groups, there are various sections, different lobbies working out there. 
But when it comes to a divided discourse, of course, uh, the, the students there in India or the Indian community wouldn't like a man of this nature. And of course, we have seen those protests as well. But there are sympathizers that exist. What kind of narrative have you witnessed around this element called Amritpal Singh? Um, Anisha, just to break it down. So there are two different uh, pol polities that exist in Britain. One sure. which is bothered about what happens, what politics is played out in India. Hmm. And one which is absolutely not bothered. <laughs> The one which is not bothered is the one that essentially the Indian diaspora ends up voting for because, uh, you know, we're, we're quite a divided, unit, uh, uh, divided society. So, uh, you know, people who work within services or public services would essentially vote for the Labour Party. People who work within private sector or banking or financial sectors would, would essentially vote for the Lib Dems or the, or the Conservatives. Mm. The ones who vote for the Labour Party is where the concern is because Labour Party is the one which is playing the, the what I would call is the cheap electoral politics of vote bank politics. And they are the ones who are driving this wedge and they are playing out the politics of India in Britain. Mm. So you would see often you would see Labour MPs being part of these protests, actively driving these protests. You would see them standing up in Parliament and questioning India's stance on, you know, Article 370 or, you know, what India is doing in Kashmir or what India is doing in Punjab, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's where the problem essentially lies. And very soon you're going to have a Labour government in a couple of years because uh, at this rate, we don't see the Conservatives making it to, into the uh, through the elections in 2024. Mm -hmm. So that's I, th I think that will be a massive challenge uh, for the for the, for any government that is coming into power in India. Hmm. You've you've put that very rightly that it's a it's a divided house in many ways and uh, that's why there are different kind of narratives that exist. Uh, Mr. Trigonia, giving you the last word there as we close this debate, is it more than the you know the rare show of optics that came by removing the barricades that India can do at this point in time? Yes, in the medium term or in the long term, we can have some more measures that we can think about. But when it comes to this issue right now, is it something more you would suggest the Indian government do? Well, I think that if there is no reaction, although there are statements have been made by the British government and even their high commissioner here, yeah. but expressing regret or expressing condemnation and all that is just not sufficient because there are repetitive acts like this. And therefore, there are two things one government of India can do what they are doing now. Number one, convey a message. Uh, of course, if something happens okay. to the British diplomats here, it will be entirely our responsibility. So I don't think they'll let it go that way because India does not believe in these kind of tactics. But at the same time, we can downgrade our uh, relations at the moment. We can call back our ambassador. I mean, that is one thing that will convey some message strictly. Okay. But I don't know if it will be done or not because that will make a, uh, make a very statement. strong message yes. that if we are not secure, we can't be staying there. All right. Um, with that, it's a, a wrap on this discussion. I thank you all for joining us on the broadcast. Mr. Arun Anand, Adit Kothari, Mr. Sushan Sareen and Anil Trigunia. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us on the show. I want to cut across once again to Ritangshu Bhattacharya, who's tracking all the developments outside the Indian High Commission in uh, UK, in London, and getting us all the details. Ritangshu, the latest updates you have. Yes, Anusha, very quickly, I'll show what's happening around me at this point here. The protest continues uh, more or less as it was going on. There is no let up in terms of the security cover. I'm very quickly going to walk across because they're not letting people stand on this side. And while walking, you can understand there's a heavy security cover here. This area, this area of the street, which is where the Indian High Commission, as you'll see it in a moment, is secure. They're not letting anyone apart from the media contingent go on to that side. Hmm. This side is where the protest is going on, as you can see. Uh, they have been fairly peaceful and static for a while now. All that's happening is sloganeering and speeches against uh, against India and in favor of Pakistan. This is, of course, the flagpole that remains uh, secured uh, through barbed wire, and of course, the massive uh, the massive tricolor here, which continues to shine down upon everyone on the street uh, in terms of a visual display of Indian strength. And that's about it, Anisha. It, it, it's things are going on as normal here. Security presence is here. They don't see too concerned about the strength of the protesters on the other side of the street okay. and in about an hour or so we expect the protest to wrap up here and uh, in, in case any eventuality happens the police say they're confident that they'll be able to handle the situation and not let things worsen at all. Back to you. Ritangshu Bhattacharya getting us all the details so for now things are under control. Uh, I'm glad that this time uh, London police is able to do its job which is to ensure that this protest remains peaceful and the Indian High Commission in London is secure. Moving